welcome to our review on the brain. So first thing we need to know is what is the function of the brain? And hopefully some of you do have an idea about this because you've all got one and hopefully you're using it for your preparation for the exams. Your brain is going to process all of the information that's collected by all these different receptor cells scattered throughout your body about internal and external environmental changes. So it's going to process everything that you detect from your surroundings, both internally and externally. It's also going to process information from your hormonal system. And then using all of that information that it's gathered, it then produces a coordinated response. So your brain is the central control center, and that's going to process faster than if those functions were actually controlled in different parts of the body. So having your brain as that central point that all of this information is fed to, and then it decides what the responses will be, is so much quicker than having basically like a mini brain for each arm and a mini brain for each leg, because obviously there they have to communicate with one another as well, which would slow things down. So your brain is the central control center that processes all of this information and then produces a coordinated response. So one of the favorite questions for some unknown reason that my students like to ask me is, Miss, if I hit my head, will I kill all my brain cells? And the answer is only if you do it many, many, many times, because an adult brain has about 86 billion neurons. That's a lot of banging your head to kill all of those neurons. Even so, probably don't do it for your GCSEs anyway, just to test. You can see we've got a diagram in the middle there. Now, you do need to be able to identify the different parts of the brain that are on that diagram and where they are. Again, there's no quick way to do this. I can't give you some magic little trick that's going to let you know them instantly. It's a case of get a copy of the diagram, cover up the actual words, and then just test yourself on it over and over again until you can do it. So you do need to know the cerebrum, the hypothalamus, cerebellum, medulla, and the pituitary gland as a minimum. So the five main areas of the brain that we need to know their names and what they do. Cerebrum, first of all, and that's going to control the complex behavior. So this is the bit that's going to control your ability to learn the memory part, your personality and any of those conscious thoughts going on. So the cerebrum kind of important there and you can see it located over at the, towards the top of the brain. The cerebellum, this is the bit that controls your posture, balance and the involuntary movements. And you can see that one is kind of at the back of your skull, a bit lower down. The medulla controls automatic actions. So this is things like your heart rate and your breathing rate. And you can see the medulla there slightly further forward, but again, towards the lower part of your skull. The hypothalamus regulates temperature and your water balance. And you can see that one's kind of smack bang in the middle. And then your pituitary gland is the one that's going to store and release hormones that regulate a wide number of bodily functions. And you can see that sits just in front of the hypothalamus there. So it's all good and fine that we sit there and we tell you about these parts of the brain and what they do. But how did we work this out? If we go back to what we used to do in the past, then we carry out this whole process of brain mapping using evidence from stroke patients. So what we could actually do there is work out which regions of the brain control which functions. We also use electrodes, which we can place inside both animal and human brains. And then when we send that little electrical signal down through the electrodes and it stimulates that region of the brain, we kind of watch what happens. So that gives us an idea about what region of the brain stimulates what response. If we now bring this up to the present day, then we've gone away from this whole process of generally just shoving electrodes into brains and stimulating to see what happens for the kind of obvious reason that people don't generally sign up to have electrodes shoved in their brains. These days, because technology has improved, then we've actually got a bit of technology called a CT scan, which is a computed tomography scan. 
Now this uses x-rays in order to produce 3D images of the inside of the body without that need for the slicing and the dicing. Now you see an example on the right there starting from the very top in the bottom right corner and then slicing further and further down through the head showing all those different regions of the brain. Now if we compare large numbers of these then we can identify any anomalous or odd regions and link that into the behaviour changes that are being shown by that person. There is a downside to these though because it uses x-rays then that does mean that it increases the risk of cancer. A second type of scan that we can use is an MRI scan. Now these are ones that use very powerful magnets and we produce images again of inside the brain. Obviously it's a powerful magnet so this is the one that if you ever have to have an MRI scan they always ask you to remove any piercings or bits of metal first. If you don't the machine will remove them for you so always make sure no metal. We can also take that a step further by using what's called an fMRI or functional MRI because what they do with this is you're still in the MRI scanner but they're getting you to do something while you're in there. So we produce these real-time images that show how different regions of the brain are being stimulated at the point of you seeing something or experiencing something or doing something. So what we can then see is where the increased blood flow is occurring and that then tells us which bits of the brain are stimulated for a particular activity. When we consider some of the difficulties associated with carrying out these studies on the brain, then there are several we need to bear in mind. First one is in order for us to be able to share information that we gain from any investigation, we've got to have the consent of the patient. And there may be some people who may not be willing to give that consent as depending on what anomalies they have, society may deem them as those curiosities or the old freaks from the freak show, for example. We also require a large number of case studies to actually be able to analyse and draw reliable conclusions. And we may not necessarily have large numbers of people available with the exact same conditions. Each study that we look at is actually individual and therefore will have slightly different results. So this is going to make it quite hard to draw conclusions that are that reliable because we will have slightly different changes in each individual person. We may also see issues in terms of identifying exactly what region of a brain does what because several areas of the brain may be involved in any given function. And the last one, when we're considering the fact that not everything has to be done on humans, we could obviously go back to sticking electrodes in animals' brains, then some people may not agree with that because animal testing isn't always viewed as an ethical practice. So it's not just shoving electrodes in their brains. They've also carried out things like the MRI scans on dogs that have been trained to lie perfectly still in an MRI scanner. Again, some people may not think that's ethical. Hopefully at the end of this video you can now state the function of the brain, you can describe the function of the main structures and locate them from a diagram, and you can explain why it's difficult to investigate brain function.